President Pinera, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Peter Sutherland and I'm Chairman of the Board of Governors of the London School of Economics and Political Science. And I'm honored to be here to introduce to you President Pinera and to welcome you, many of you back, to a place that you know well. We would be pleased to welcome President Pinera at any time to this school. But with the whole world watching Chile, as it has done during recent times and the freeing of the 33 trapped miners last week, it's a particular moment of celebration which the whole world almost uniquely could share in. And it's a special pleasure, therefore, to be in his company this evening and to thank him for his time. This school has a long tradition of connection with Chile. We have around 30 students from Chile each year and we're in touch with about 300 more of our alumni. There's a very active Friends of LSE alumni group in Chile who just last month celebrated their 25th anniversary, making it one of the oldest formal alumni groups of the school. Mr. President, we see your visit this evening as strengthening the ties that we have with you and your country. President Piñera was born in Santiago, spent his early years abroad in Belgium and the United States, traveling with his father, who was Chilean ambassador to Belgium and later ambassador to the United Nations. He returned to Chile for, sec for secondary school and university, where he graduated from the Pontifical Catholic University of Chile with degree in economics, degree, a degree in economics and as a recipient of the Raoul Ivor Oxley Prize for best overall student of his class. President Piñera continued his studies as a postgraduate at Harvard, where he obtained a master's and then a doctorate. He then went on to be professor of economics at various universities in Chile until 1988. Focusing on his political career, first as a senator for East Santiago, but also participating in various successful business ventures and establishing numerous foundations such as the Enterprising Women Foundation. He was elected president and sworn into office in March of this year. 2010 was to be a year for particular celebration for Chile, marking the bicentennial year of independence. It was also to become a year of challenges, ranging from a devastating earthquake in February to the near tragedy which turned into a celebration which I have referred to earlier, that of the miners in August, whose resolution and character when they emerged was something that we particularly admired as we watched it all over the world. But we also were impressed and inspired by the way that Chile itself, a new president, dealt with the issue at hand. It allowed Chilean ingenuity and resolution to be displayed on the world stage in a very positive and constructive way. I'm therefore delighted to welcome you, Mr. President, to LSE and invite you to speak to us now. Thank you very much, Peter, for your kind words. Really, it's for me a privilege and an honor to have the opportunity to address you in this London School of Economics and Political Science, such a famous and prestigious institute, which was created, among others, by Bernard Shaw himself. I would like to share with you some thoughts about what's happening in Chile and maybe in the world, in the economic, political, and social field. We'll talk about the miners, 
and this huge and successful search and rescue effort. And we try to talk about the future, which is really what is important for all of us. Let me start trying to make a quick summary of what is going on in my country in terms of the political and economic challenges that we are facing now. If you remember Joe's dream in the Bible, when he dreamed about fat and lean cows, you will see that we can make a very fair comparison. Because during 12 years, from 1986 until 1997, Chile went through a period of fat cow. During that period, the Chilean economy was able to grow on average at 8% a year. So we were able to double our per capita income every 10 years. Our productivity went up very strongly. The creation of new jobs were almost, almost as strong as our growth capacity. And the unemployment rate was going consistently down. During that period, we were always able to reduce our poverty level by half. And during that time, the world was not growing that fast. It was growing only at 3%. The interest rate was very high compared to today's rates. And the copper price, which is our main export, was in the $1 area. In that period, Chile always also was able to recover our democracy, which is a natural way of life for the Chilean people. And we did it in a very sound and wise way. Normally, transition from military governments to democratic governments take place in the middle of political crisis, economic riots, and social unrest, which was not the case of Chile. The transition in Chile, the first transition, which by now is the old transition, was a peaceful one and a very wise one. Unfortunately, everything changed by the end of, last decade, of the last decade. Because from 1998 until 2009, we went through another 12-year period, but this time it were not fat cows, but lean cows. As you see, GDP growth went down by half, more than half, only to 3.4% on average. Productivity, which was rising, stagnated. Our creation of new jobs was much weaker than in the previous period. And the same thing happened with our unemployment rate, which started to go up. And during that time, the world was accelerating. The interest rate was going down, and the price of copper was going up, up. Therefore, something happened that changed the path of the Chilean economy. And we want to produce another change, but in the opposite direction. As I, you can see, while the world was accelerating, Chile was slowing down. And in the first time, we, in the first period, we were able to double the rate of growth of the world. In the second period, we were always, almost, able, only able to tie or to equal the world growth rate. As you can see, this was a very consistent path because the average rate of growth started with 7.7 percent during the first democratic government, and it started to go down and down and down, as you can see. <laughs> so now, we want, to change, we want to change history and recover our growth. <laughs> Next time, you should put the 7%. <laughs> because right now, we are growing at 7% per year in a very consistent way. And why is this so important? Because in the first period, which was a golden period, people used to talk about Chile using the word Chilean miracle. In the second period, which wasn't a golden period, people talk about the nap, the Chilean nap. And we want to go back to the Chilean miracle. That's the biggest challenge that our government, which has been in office only for seven months, will have to face. And this is very important, not only for economic reasons, because really, this is a transition from, because really, if we are able to unite our country and put in front of us very big and ambitious goals, but feasible ones, 
In our case, we want to become the first Latin American country. Remember that we are celebrating our bicentennial to be able, within this decade, before the end of this decade, to be able to defeat poverty, overcome underdevelopment, and create a society of opportunities, and at the same time, social justice for everybody. That is our main goal, challenge, and target. Achieve development, defeat poverty, and create a society with opportunities for everybody. The sky is the limit. But at the same time, with dignity for everybody, which means a minimum floor guarantee to every person for the simple reason of being a human being. And for that, we will need to work harder and faster than before. Our goal is to create a society of opportunities at the same time of social justice and of values because those are the three key elements of the society we are trying to build in Chile with the effort and commitment of each and every Chilean. What are the goals that we have set up for our government, which is seven months old? First of all, recover our growth capacity, which went down to almost 2%. We want to restore it to 6 or 7%, which is what we need in order to be able to double our per capita income within this decade and therefore achieve the same level of development that countries like Spain, Portugal, and other southern European countries are having right now. And for that, we need to strengthen the typical and traditional pillars to have a very stable democracy, which is the normal way of life. I know that the democracy has a lot of problems. It's like marriage. It has a lot of problems. <laughs> many problems, and I, I know what I'm talking about because I have been married for 38 years. <laughs> but, to, but up to now, nobody has been able to invent anything better. <laughs> so democracy, social market economy, open economy, free economy, competitive economy is the second pillar. The third one is to have a very strong state to fight against poverty and excessive inequalities. But that's not enough. In this 21st century, in the society of, of knowledge and information that we're living today in, we need to add more pillars. We need to improve the quality of our human capital and our educational system. We need to increase the amount of investment, which has gone down to 21% of GMP, and we want to get it back to 30% of GMP. We need to promote entrepreneurship, innovation, and use and invest more in new technologies and have a more flexible society to be able to deal with change, which is the only constant of the actual real world. So we won't start by explaining why to recover our growth rate is so important. Here you have the trend of the growth rate, historical growth rate. And here you have what the first one, the red line, is the world growth rate. The second line is Chilean growth rate. You see that we were above the world for, many, for a long period of time, but then we, we did rest on our laurels. And you know that when you do that, you don't get the result you need and you deserve. Now we are recovering our growth rate, which is absolutely needed for a country that is facing this huge challenge to become a developed country without poverty within this decade. For that reason, we have already done part of the job. Because right now, the Chilean economy is growing at 7% per year. That means that we are number one among OECD countries, and we are part of that organization. And we are number two in Latin America. Next year, we want to recover our pole position in terms of growth capacity. At the same time, we can make a simple comparison between last year, 2009, and this year, 2010. In terms of growth, last year, the rate of growth was minus 1.5%. This year, we will be very close to 6% and going up. Last year, we lost 30,000 jobs. This year, we will create 300,000 jobs. And therefore, the unemployment rate is going down. The investment rate is going up. Exports are also going up and the total 
fact of productivity, which is a key fact, fact of, to explain our growth, is recovering from a negative rate last year. So you see that we are experiencing already a kind of renaissance to be able to keep going at the same path and in the right direction for a long period of time if we want to get rid of underdevelopment and poverty. For that, we have set some specific goals to create one million jobs within the period 2010 and 2014, which represent almost 20% of our labor force. We have already created almost 200,000 jobs in five months, and we think that for the whole year, the creation of jobs will exceed 300,000 jobs, which is the highest job creation figure in the history of our country. And above that, we need to create decent jobs. And therefore, we're taking good care, not only of creating jobs, but good jobs in terms of salaries, which are going up. And also, uh, by doing that, reduce an unemployment rate, which has been a double digit for two long periods, and one now is going down, and we hope that it will keep going down. Also, we are working on other goals, not only growth and employment, but to start winning a battle that we cannot lose, the battle against crime and drugs trafficking. And we're working on that in four different areas, prevention, protection, justice, and rehabilitation. We are doing an effort in these four areas, which is absolutely necessary to start winning that war that we have been losing during the last years. And we are already collecting or harvesting the first results because victim rate and fear rate is going down and we have been able to increase our capacity to fight against organized crime and uh, drug trafficking in our country. So we are, have been talking about growth, employment, also security, and our war on crime and drugs. But on top of that, we will have to face two major reforms, which is the health and the educational reform. In the last 20 years, we have multiplied by six public expenditures in these two areas. But we have not been able to increase quality in education and health, according to the financial effort that we have made. Actually, the quality in education and health have almost stayed absolutely stagnated during the last 20 years. And therefore, that's another challenge, another battle that we will have to face. And it's not only a question of resources. There is also a question of management and efficiency. And for that, we will need to undertake major structural reforms in both of those two important sectors sector, health and education. I don't want to bother you with the details, but I will leave a copy of this presentation if, in case you want to go deeper than what we are able to do it now. But I all, only want to tell you that in terms of education, we will double the public subsidies per student within the next eight years. That's part of the effort. The other effort is to improve teacher quality, to set up a network of ex acad ac academies of excellence in each and every region of Chile, to expand preschool education in order to be able to cover each and every child, particularly those which are born in, most, in the most vulnerable homes and families, extend college scholarships, and many of them will come to England or to Great Britain, and at the same time catch up in two major reforms, to become a bilingual country, and to enter in a very strong way into the new society of knowledge and information. And for that, we are implementing a digital revolution, which means that we will get with broadband and computers to each child, each school, and each family in our country within the next four years. That's the educational revolution. But we also have another goal, which is poverty, because Chile was extremely successful in defeating poverty. It went down from almost 40% by 1990 to 13% in 2006. But then we experimented a very serious setback because for the first time in 20 years, poverty started to go up again in the last three years. And that's a battle that we cannot lose. 
Therefore, the goal of defeating extreme poverty within the next four years and to get rid of poverty, which has been with us for the last 200 years of independent life, is probably the most sherry and maybe the most defiant goals that we, ha we have set for our government. We also want to increase the quality of our democratic system because, as you see, the citizen participation in democracy is going down. In the late 80s, almost 90% of the population were participating in our democracy and election. But, but that is going down, as you can see, and that's something we'll have to change, and we are undertaking a major reform of our democratic system, including automatic registration, voluntary voting, right to vote for Chilean abroad, and establishing blind trust law in order to prevent any conflict of interest for, of people that have interest in the private sector, at the same time they have commitment with the public service. That is already on its way. At the same time, we made a decision a long time ago to integrate our country to the world. And therefore, this integration, as you can see, has been expressed in free trade agreements with more than 57 countries in the world that represent more than 60% of the population and more than 70% of world GMP with, with America, with Latin America, with the European Union, with China, with India, with Australia, and many other countries. We already have free trade agreements. I think there is only a couple of countries in the world that can show a picture like this, Israel and Mexico. And we are moving forward because I hope that next month we will sign our next free trade agreement with Malaysia. And that's not the end of the story because we have a commitment to continue in this path of integrating our economy, a small economy in the ends of the world, to the world economy, particularly now. Because let me tell you something. In 1988, two wars broke down. The first one was the Iron Curtain, or the Berlin Wall, that separated the world in two different blocks, the Eastern and the Western Hemisphere. And you know that that was part of the history of our 20th century. Two hemispheres that had no dialogue and that they saw life, society, and values in such a different way. But there was another world that also broke down. This didn't go from south to north. It went from east to west, separating the northern hemisphere where were all the developed countries from the southern hemisphere where were all the underdeveloped countries. And we think that we have to take advantage of the fall of those two walls. Advantage in terms of promoting democracy and freedom and human rights respect all over the world, but also take advantage of defeating underdevelopment and poverty, which has been with us for the last 200 years of independent life. In addition to these goals, which were part of our government program, with which we faced the last presidential elections, we had to incorporate another goal, to reconstruct our country, because on February 27th, very early in the morning, we were hit by one of the world, actually, the fifth world earthquake in the known history of mankind. And that earthquake was devastating and destroyed a good part of our infrastructure in terms of school, hospital, bridges, and many other, many other parts of our infrastructure. And after that earthquake, which was endless, you couldn't stand because it was impossible because of the strength of that earthquake. We were hit by two, three, or four tsunamis that devastated our coast and took the life of many, many people. It was, as, as, as I told you before, the fifth worst earthquake in the history of mankind. In the Richter scale, it was 8.8. .8. The worst one happened in Chile, <coughs> Valdivia. And the other three were Alaska, Sumatra, and Kamchatka. The fifth one was the one that hit us on February 27th. The toll was really devastating. And you will see here how Robinson Crusoe Island was before the earthquake and after the earthquake. Constitución, 
a major city in the south part of the country before the earthquake and after the earthquake. Here you have a bridge in our main route before the earthquake and after the earthquake. Just to give you some example of how strong and devastating that earthquake and tsunami were. The inventory of damage was huge. We lost more than 500 lives. And there are still many, many people missing. Almost 2 million people were direct victims of those phenomena. And almost 4 million people had to face shortages of electricity power and water supply for many, many weeks because of the effects of the earthquake. 1,250,000 students, one out of three, couldn't go back to school because their schools had been absolutely destroyed. 79 hospitals, one out of three, also was, was destroyed or severely damaged. 370,000 homes were damaged or destroyed. Thousands of micro, small, and medium-sized firms were absolutely destroyed or damaged, and we lost in a few seconds 120,000 jobs. 211 bridges were destroyed or damaged, and thousands of miles of roads, ports, airports were paralyzed. That was the picture that we had to face on March 11th, when we had the responsibility to take, to take the control of the government in my country. The total cost in economic terms, because the lives can never be measured in economic terms, was $30 billion. That represents 18% of our GNP. Just to make a comparison, the Katrina tsunami represented less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of US GNP. In our case, it was 18% of GNP. I think that there has never been in the history of mankind a, an earthquake so devastating in terms of damage as the one that we had to face on August, on February 27. Immediately we set up a reconstruction plan and the total cost, public cost of this re, that reconstruction plan is $8.5 million. 8000 and $500 million. And we are funding that with fiscal austerity, with a law that has allowed private donations, with partial use of government savings and public debt, with sale of disposable assets, with some tax adjustment, and also with a special mining royalty, because the mining sector in Chile is very important and is going through a tremendous prosperous, prosperous stage. And we had, therefore, a triple challenge. Rebuild our country and to rebuild it better than what it was before the earthquake. Achieve all our government programs and goals and accomplish our main goals of defeating and the development and overcoming poverty. Why is so important the growth capacity of the country? It's not only an economic reason, it's a moral reason. Because when you have 2.5 million people living in poverty, to grow is a moral demand, and it's really a moral commitment. If we keep growing at 3%, which is more than what was the average of the last government, it will take us until 2028 to defeat poverty and underdevelopment. If we are able to raise our growth rate to 6%, it will take us only until 2018, within this decade, to perform those same goals. And for that, we need not only good economic policy, we will need the unity, the strength, the faith, and the commitment of all Chilean people, particularly those unknown heroes that appear after the earthquake and were very much responsible for the strong capacity of our country to stand up and walk again. Also, on August, the, August 5, we had to face another challenge, which was the mining accident in a mine in the desert of Atacama, in the northern part of the country that caught 33 miners, almost half a mile below the mountain. And I would like to show you a brief video of that experience.
second, please. This is an expression of Murphy's law. Believe me, it has been a moving, emotional <coughs> story from the beginning until the end. I remember as if it was today when we knew about this accident. Immediately, we realized that it was a very serious one, that 33 miners were caught 
700 meters down the mountain, under tons and tons of rock. And we realized that the private company that owned the mine and was responsible for its operation did have no possibility, no capability to deal with the huge search and rescue effort that had to be undertaken. At that same night, without losing a second, we decided to take full responsibility for the search and rescue effort. I remember, because I was with our Minister of Mining in Ecuador, in a meeting, in a dinner meeting with President Rafael Correa, and the next day we were going to Colombia to attend the inauguration ceremony of President Santos. That, that was the only decision that we could make, because it was either us or nobody. And therefore, it was a hard decision, but at the same time, it was a very clear decision. And we took it from the very first moment. And when I came back to Chile, and went to the mine immediately, and met with the families, we made a commitment to search them, each and every miners, as if they were our sons, to do whatever was necessary, to knock all the doors, to look for the best technology available in the world, and machinery, and to set up the best possible teams of workers and engineers to undertake this huge challenge. <coughs> and for 17 days, we were days of a lot of anguish and uncertainty. We were looking for them blindly, really, because we didn't know where they were. We didn't know whether they were dead or alive. But we never lost our faith and our committee. And we kept looking and looking. And we tried once and again and again and again. And after 17 days of a lot of uncertainty and night, we were able finally to make contact with them. That day, a real explosion of joy, tears, emotion went through each and every corner of my country. And I know now, now that also it impact the whole world. And that day, it was a Sunday, August the 22nd, when the drill finally made contact with them, they attached this message to the drill, this famous message, very simple one. We are well in the shelter, the 33. And I remember that day because it was a very special day for me because that day my father-in-law passed away. And we were with him that morning. And his last words before dying, m minutes before dying, was never give up. Keep searching. They are alive. And when my wife came and I told her what his father had told me before, she said to me, go to the mine immediately because I'm, I have a feeling, an intuition, that something great would happen today. And I went there. And immediately after arriving, we knew that all the miners, each and every one of them were alive. And you cannot imagine what was the emotion that we felt that day. And then we started implementing what had been planned in advance, how to rescue them. I remember our conversation with the engineers, and they said, look, we have three possible technologies, the American one, the Australian one, and the Chilean one. Which one should we use? And I told them, the three of them. Yeah. <laughs> because the machinery can fail, the plan can fail, but we cannot fail. And at the end of the day, it was a Chilean technology, the one that was able to get there first. And that Phoenix capsule that you saw was also Chilean made with Chilean technology by Chilean engineers. And we, felt, we feel very proud about that. And finally, last Wednesday and Thursday, and we spent the whole night there reading each and every miner as they were coming from the deep of the mountains to back to life, back to their families, to the surface. It was really a moment that I think that 1.2 billion people around the world will never forget. And I have asked myself many times why this has been so moving and people have, feel, have felt so committed. And I think that in, in the history of mankind, normally big news are bad news like September 11th, or earthquake, or things like that. But this time, it was a good news. It was 
a story that started as a possible tragedy, but ended as a real blessing. And I think that that has moved so many people around the world. And we have learned the lesson, because we have, there are many, many things that we have to change in the way that we treat our workers, their safety, their security, their lives, their health. And that's something that is underway in my country. Therefore, I would like to end that in this case, there was an unconditional government commitment from the very first day. We didn't lose a second. And the whole country was united and committed with this challenge. And that, I think, is the main reason why this has been a happy ending story and why we have been successful. Because I think that never in the history of mankind a rescue effort like this has taken place successfully as we did in Chile. And that's something that has reached the hearts of millions, billions of people around the world. I would like to end this presentation saying that this is not the end, it's just the beginning. We will have to face many, many challenges in the future. Defeat poverty, defeat under development, become part of the first world, take advantage of the opportunities of the society of information, the society of knowledge, which will be very generous with those that are really willing to take advantage of it, but will be very indifferent or even cruel with those countries that just want to leave it passed away. And those two challenges that we'll have to face from now on will need, will require from us to recover the lost time, at the same time to speed up towards fully developed, developed status. And therefore, we will have to rely and inspire ourselves in the example of many, many people. And I have chosen two of those. The first one is that we will have to run faster than ever, even faster than Hossein Bolt. <laughs> and we'll also, we'll also we'll have to jump higher than the beautiful Elena is here. <laughs> But we're sure that after this lesson, this experience, Chile is a more united country, a stronger country, and is able to face these challenges. And also I think that Chile is more known, better known, and more respected, and more valued around the world. That's why I think that with the same force that we pray to God, because we needed his help, now we have to be very grateful, because he heard our prayers. And I'm sure, that Chile is now in a better position than ever to achieve those goals that have been cherished by our fathers and grandfathers, but they have never been achieved. And our generation, the generation of the Byzantine, has the tremendous challenge of achieving those goals. And for that, I'm sure that we will come with the unity and strength and of each and every Chile. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, the President, after that inspirational address, has agreed to take a few questions. So I would ask anybody who wishes to ask a question, I'm only going to be able to take a few, to raise their hands. I'm going to take them in, in groups of three. This lady on the far right, there is a microphone, I think, that should be available to you. Hi. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, my name is Deborah Navarro-Rosenblatt. I'm coming from the London School of Agile and Tropical Medicine. 
I would like to ask about your position in the emergency contraception pill and also about what? The <laughs> Huh? And also, I would like to. I mean, you mentioned the policy of um, Chilean living abroad. I would like to know in which stage is that a policy now? Um, did everyone hear? You want me to repeat it? I, we can't hear the. We can't hear the question. Okay, so, sorry. Um, I just want to ask um, President Piñera, he mentioned the policy that they have in mind to work on the policy of uh, Chilean people uh, living abroad, voting. So I would like to know in which stage is that policy? El voto en el extranjero. Thank you. Thank you very much. So can I have another question, please? This gentleman on the left of the edge, yes, with his hand up here in the brown, yes. Uh, good evening, Mr. President Piñera. Um, my name is Hugo Rojas. I'm studying a Master in Law, Anthropology and Society here at LSC. I have two questions. Uh, taking into account uh, the ethnic conflict uh, and tensions, especially in the south of Chile, I would like to know if your government uh, plans to re-examine the pillars um, of the Chilean nation state in order to promote a more inclusive multicultural state. And secondly, uh, President Bachelet created the Human Capital Development Program, and I would like to know if your government, government will continue the bicentennial scholarships or will transform scholarships into loans. One more question in this group. <laughs> Gentlemen here in the middle. President Piñera, thank you very much. It's uh, like an honor for the Chilean community uh, that you're here. My name is Kenzo Sahi. It doesn't seem so, but I'm a Chilean. <laughs> it's here, here. Um, so um, there is robust evidence that um, countries that implement a voluntary vote vis-a-vis -vis a mandatory vote, that's the one that exists in Chile nowadays, um, poor people first vote less, Second, um, investment in social policies decrease. And finally, and the most undesirable consequence, is that uh, the GDP coefficient uh, worsens, so there is more economic inequality. So in light of this evidence, um, would your government be willing to review the, like, how desirable it is to implement a voluntary vote in Chile, given the undesired consequences that this could have? Thank you very much. President, would you like to answer some of those questions? <laughs> well, I'm 100% in favor of life. And I think that the life of a person who is yet to born should be protected, even more than a person that has already been born. And therefore, I'm against abortion. But I think that the day after pill is not aborted. And therefore, we favor its free distribution in order that each woman with all the information can make its own decisions. And that's our policy in Chile with respect to the day after pill. With respect to the vote of Chilean living abroad, it's a very good discussion whether the vote is a right and you should be able to accept that right freely or it's a duty and you should be forced Vote. And there is a lot of literature about that. We tend to think it as being a right rather than a duty. That's why we are in favor of voluntary voting. <coughs> and we are in favor also of automatic registration, which means in our country. Today in Chile we have almost 10 million people, 11 million people that are aged 18 or more, and therefore they are citizens, and they could vote. Only 7%, 7 million are registered, and only 6 million are voting, which means that almost 50% of our population, which could have the right to vote, are not voting and not participating. And therefore, by introducing 
the automatic registration. We will almost double the number of people with the right to vote. Of course, if it is a voluntary vote and not a mandatory vote, that could decrease the participation. On average, take into account the two effects, plus the right to vote of Chileans living abroad, which will be extended to all Chileans living abroad that have some kind of commitment with our country. Commitment which has to be measured, of course, but the idea is that if he, is, he feels Chileans as you feel, and you look like a Chilean, don't, <laughs> don't, <coughs> don't get it wrong. <laughs> if you go to Chile, people won't see anything special on you. <laughs> they will recognize as one of ours. So by introducing automatic registration, by giving the right to both to Chilean living abroad that have a commitment with Chile, I think that that will be more than compensate. That will more than compensate the less vote that will happen because it is a voluntary vote. And I agree with you. It's, it's something that we can debate. Nobody has the absolute truth, unless, except you, that you have made so clear the consequence <laughs> of putting the voluntary vote. But in terms of inequality that you mentioned, that's a very important issue for us. As I told during the presentation, defeat poverty and reduce inequality, and to create a society of equality uh, of opportunity for everybody and more equal opportunity for, equal for everybody is part of our it's the core part of our problem and for that we will use two type of instruments like the CISO that use the two plates to cut a piece of paper the first one will attack the causes the real causes of poverty and <coughs> excessive inequality which in my opinion are lack of employment opportunity a bad quality of education and the weakness of family. Since it will take time to work on those three areas, we will implement the second blade of the system, which will not go to the final causes, but it will try to minimize the effect of poverty and inequality. And we will introduce next year in, in Chile the ethical minimum family income, which means that the state will complement the incomes of families so that each and every one of them will be able to get beyond the poverty line. The first one goes directly to the real causes, the second one to the consequence. The two together will do the job in the time framework that we have set for this, which is four years to defeat extreme poverty and eight years to defeat poverty at all. With respect to scholarships, we believe that that's the matter, that the educational battle is the matter of all the battles. And we are very much committed, not only to increase resources, and we will double our investment in education within the next eight years, but we will also undertake huge structural reforms, improving the quality of our teachers, in improving also the quality of our schools, giving more information to parents so they can make decisions whether they send the, the children to one school or another, or another with real and good information. We will also increase the quality of our higher education. And for that, we will substantially strengthen and increase our scholarship program. Now we are sending around 3,000 students to graduate studies in in many different universities around the world, including, of course, the London School of Economics and Political Science. Next year will be substantially increased because we really believe that we have to win the battle to increase the quality of our education. With respect to inequality, as you were asking me before, I think really that the real causes and the real challenge to improve the quality of our social justice and to create a society of equal opportunity is much more related with our capacity to create good jobs, to improve the quality of education of the most vulnerable children and to strengthen our family. And in the meantime, as I was telling you before, I think that this minimum ethical family income will be able to complement the other blade in order to be able to achieve the goals that we have set to ourselves within the next four years. Now, can I take, I'm going to take two more questions. Um, can I have this gentleman over here on the right?
thank you very much um, again for this uh, wonderful talk. Um, we are here in the uni uh, European Union. Uh, Chile is one of the furthest away, the country in uh, Latin America that's the furthest away. Could you probably highlight one of the uh, countries here in the Euro European Union or maybe a um, sector or even a plan that would be that you would think is a strategic importance for Chile. Thank you very much. This gentleman here with glasses, um, here with his hand up, just here. Yes. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, it's in your government's program to develop decent jobs, uh, investing in creative uh, workforce in Chile. Do you think that the strategy that is in your official report, which is uh, opening the economy for foreign investment to explore uh, raw materials and minerals, is the right way to create decent positions like this Chilean worker working for a British company producing tobacco? What kind of knowledge he uses producing raw materials? And what do you understand by human capital? Thank you. President. <laughs> it's true, Chile is a very far away country in the ends of the world. <coughs> and we are a kind of island because we are separated from the world by natural forces. We have one of the driest deserts in the world in the northern frontier, the biggest ocean in the world in the western frontier, the highest mountains in the world in the eastern frontier, and the South Pole in the other <laughs> But Chile has always been an open country. And we have proved, I mentioned before, that Chile is the, has the most open economy in the world. And not only in economic terms, because now we are looking not only for free trade agreements, but political agreements, cultural agreements to integrate our country to the world. And for that, of course, we have worked very hard to reach these free trade agreements and political and cultural agreements with Europe. And we have this agreement with with Europe since 2002. I was talking a few hours ago with Prime Minister David Cameron because we want to accelerate and to speed up the process of integration with Europe. There is a clause which is called the evolutionary clause by which after five years you can speed up the process because it's a gradual process. And we are ready for that. And I hope that Europe will also be ready for that and we have the support of Spain and England and I hope that before the end of this week, we will get the support of France and Germany, which will be visited by us during this week. And if you ask me what are two strategic countries, I would say Spain is one, because it's our motherland. And that's something which is always very strong. The second one would be England, or Great Britain, because we have had so strong ties since our independence. Our founder father, Bernardo Higgins, lived and studied here in Great Britain for many, many years. The founder of our Navy was Lord Thomas Cochrane, which was also a Royal Navy official. And he was the one that created our Navy and sunk the Spaniard, Spaniard flow twice. So we also had our own Trafalgar. <laughs> McKenna, another, another Irish was the one that created the military uh, engineer corps. So we have had ties from the very, very beginning, including Charles Darwin spent a long journey in Chile, and he did a good part of his research in our land. And therefore, we have had these historic ties with England, and we share the values. Yesterday, I received a magnificent gift which was a very old co copy of the Carta Magna or Magna Carta, which is the cradle of democracy. And therefore, we share with Britain its value, the, our commitment with democracy, with human rights, with the state of law, with the 
care that we have to take with our environment. And therefore, I would say that Spain and Britain probably are among our most important and strategic ally, allies in this effort that we will have to jointly undertake. In terms of, of what we've been talking with David Cameron, basically we have reached five agreements which we will pursue and push very hard. One in terms of education, and we will send hundreds or thousands of Chilean students to study here in Britain. In terms of energy, particularly new, clean, renewable energy, we have a tremendous opportunity. We have the desert with the highest radiation in the world. We have thousands and thousands of miles of coast to use the energy of the oceans. We have a tremendous opportunity in using the wind as a source of energy. We have also the, a, a country full of volcanoes to use geothermic or bioenergy. And in all those areas, we will have a very strong cooperation agreement with England. The same thing with innovation, science, technology. So we will really push very strongly this strategic alliance that we have agreed with Prime Minister David Cameron. In terms of decent, decent jobs, decent jobs means many things. First of all, to have a job. Because if you don't have a job, you don't have a decent job. That's for sure. And in our country, we have had double-digit unemployment rates for too many years. And that's not a decent job. But it's not only to have a job. It has to be a good job with a fair salary, just salary. And also with fair labor conditions in terms of how well you are protected, your life, your health, your dignity. And we are working on that harder than ever. And I don't think that foreign investment competes with decent jobs. I think that you have, at least we believe in free trade. Free trade of goods, free trade of investment, and also free movement of people. That's the kind of society that we would like to continue to create. And therefore, Chile has been and will be a country very open to foreign investments. And of course, I realize that we have to undertake a second stage in our export effort. Because at the beginning, it was basically to export raw materials, copper, wood and timber, fishing, and many others. But now we are incorporating more value added, more intelligence, more work from Chilean people, so to add value to our raw materials and start exporting goods with more value added. And for that, we need to establish strategic alliance with foreign companies to be able to penetrate foreign markets, to be able to attract the last, best, and most, uh, and most uh, developed technologies. And therefore, we are not afraid of foreign investment. And I think that Chilean entrepreneurs have always have a very open mind towards foreign investment. You think that is it's not good for the country. I disagree with you. You have the right to think as you think, and you have the right to be wrong. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Really, it really, it really captivated your audience, and we're very honoured to have you here. We have two traditions here at LSE, and we hope you'll help us to continue them tonight. I'd like to invite Juan Pablo Alpern, Alpern, I think you would probably say in Spanish, a Chilean student in uh, LSE, to first present you with LSE's formal certificate to recognise your visit. Secondly, <laughs> secondly uh, President, since it was inaugurated through uh, Nelson Mandela when he came here and spoke as you have done, we gave him an LSE baseball cap. <laughs> We've presented prime ministers, 
presidents, business leaders with one, and here is one for you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, one final announcement.